Let's get right into it. If you, especially as an African or African American, if you really want to get an understanding of Buddhism, you are not going to get a clear understanding of Buddhism from the Japanese. Period. In fact, when you study Buddhism, you are not really going to get a clear perspective of Buddhism because of the history of Buddhism. Now, let's bring some explanations here to explain why you're not going to get a clear explanation of Buddhism. See, there are two types of Buddhism. Actually, there are three types of Buddhism. Now, when you study the history of Buddhism, it's confusing because there are three types of Buddhas. Now, in Japan and in Asia and even among the Europeans, what you get when you study Buddhism, a lot of what you get is what is called Hindu Buddhism. Are you listening? It's called Hindu Buddhism. Now, there's Buddhism, there's Hindu Buddhism, and then there is the Buddhism of Shakyamuni Buddha that explains in the Lord of Sutra. So that's three types of Buddhism. Now, this lecture today actually deals with the racism in Buddhism, because to really understand Buddhism, you have to extricate or get rid of the racism in Buddhism. In order to get rid of the racism in Buddhism, we have to begin to look at our mindset and look at our consciousness as it relates to Buddhism. Now, let's talk about Hindu Buddhism, so you, so you can understand it. And we explain how Hindu Buddhism got mixed up with Buddhism and it really contaminates or distorts the whole understanding of the Buddhist teachings. See, the Buddha, or the historical Buddha Shakyamuni, was what you call a Dalit, a Dravidian. He was among the indigenous people of India. See, when you study Buddhism, we got to first of all give you a clear understanding of Buddhism. See, when you study Buddhism from the standpoint of the Japanese, you got to first of all understand that Buddhism did not start in Japan. When Buddhism got to Japan, it didn't get to Japan until 1100 years later. One of the greatest anthropological finds uh, that happened in the world happened in 1974. A doctor by the name of Donald Johansson found one of the earliest remains of the human species uh, and they called this species Lucy. At the time, in 1974, the Beatles had a song called Lucy in the Sky, and they called this early human remains Lucy. Lucy was a woman they found in Ethiopia. I had the pleasure, me and my beautiful wife, who, who is from Ethiopia, of meeting Dr. Donald Johansson, who was in Memphis, Tennessee, to do a lecture on Lucy. One of the interesting things that I found in that lecture, they were showing the evolution of the human species. And at the end of the evolution or evolutionary chart, that was a European man. And Dr. Donald Johansson said, and he stopped and he said, listen, what we see here in the evolutionary chart is a white man or European. 
this is really not true evolution because evolution started in Africa. And what Dr. Johansson and what other anthropologists who are fair, they too begin to tell the truth about history. Now, we who are Buddhists must understand history to clearly get an understanding of Buddhism. Now, in our history, the Greco-Roman history is a total different history than the history we see and read about even today. See, the Greco-Roman history, they understood that it was the Africans who built the pyramids, who started our early civilization. Now, with the advent of the transatlantic slave trade, what the Europeans had to do, particularly the British and the Germans, is that they had to distort history in order to perpetuate a white superiority. So now those of you who study Buddhism and who learn Buddhism, you are not really learning a true Buddhism because the true Buddhism is what you say a Eurocentric style of Buddhism that distorts the facts. In fact, Buddhism is not sitting around in some mountain meditating, but Buddhism is everyday living. In fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, it was February in America, and I did a black history lecture, and I had my son, Anthony Alf Elmore Jr., and I was telling my son that Buddhist history it's really black history because the Buddha Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, was actually what is called a Dalit. Uh, they call them Dalits, Dravidians, Nubians, but it's all the same people. The original or indigenous people of India were people of African descent. For example, my wife comes from Ethiopia, and in Ethiopia they found the earliest human being ever in the history of man, and they called it Arty. In fact, they did a study, a paper, they did a whole series on Arty because this is the earliest species of man. In fact, in Ethiopia they got a the teachings of the king called the Nebra. Nebuchadnezzar, and this is the study of the kings of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the land where the oldest dynasty or unbroken dynasty, kings and queens, and the history of mankind. And of course, my wife comes from the country of Ethiopia. Now, the reason that I bring up Ethiopia is because during ancient times, India was called Eastern Ethiopia. In fact, my wife, she comes from a line of Falasha Jews. In the book, The Anaclipsis, Godfrey Higgins says that the ancient Abyssinians or the tribe of Judah was actually a group of Buddhists who came from India. So when you began to study Buddhism, you must understand Buddhism from a historical standpoint. Like, for example, I told my son that Buddhist history is black history. When I posted on YouTube a Nichiren Shu priest by the name of Runen Sorison, I, I think that's his proper name. I think he's a priest in Seattle. Uh, in fact, let me get my notes and show you exactly what this priest said. 
so we can kind of get an understanding. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that this Nitrin priest reflects the racism or the white superiority that we often find in our society or in Buddhism. Uh, in fact, when I pointed out to my son that there was a Buddhist history, uh, this priest wrote this. He says, shaking my head, such a shadow understanding leads to beliefs. Fudu Myo is rather painted black, and even being painted black doesn't mean the deity was a black deity. Black is often used to refer to mood and countenance. A friend of mine who is Japanese was often referred to as being black because he was depressed, not his skin color. <laughs> Wait a minute. Can you get a load of this nitrogen shoe priest? This guy going to write to me to tell me that his friend, who is Japanese, referred himself as black because he's depressed. Now, what kind of thing is that for a priest to tell me that his Japanese friends where I'm black means I'm depressed? I don't deal with those kind of analogies. First, first of all, what the priest said was insulting and really insensitive, and this man needs to go back and take a class on, on cultural sensitivity. This is why corporations have classes to teach you about other people. Anybody know that for you to go tell black people that his friend calls himself black and because he's depressed, this guy needs to take a lesson and, and, and culture and how to socially communicate with another people, with other people. But let's go further to what this priest says. He goes on further. He says, uh, I wrote him and I, I called him Mr. This priest wrote back and said, it's Reverend Runan, if you please. I have seen no peer reviewed academic papers or journals that mentioned that there were Africans in Japan, that any deities were Africans, something being painted black does not automatically make it African. Again, the colors were used to show emotions or traits. There are red photos, doesn't mean that Africans have red skin, they are, they are shown sitting in a fire. Does that mean that Africans sitting in fire? Or are those things like many others symbolic? Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to point out, now listen, this is a Nitrian shoe priest, a man who writes further and says, I speak fluent Japanese, and he is so, got such a problem with us telling history that this man really cannot get beyond his racism. Now, I want you to see something. Let's get down in history and let's be logical. Now I want you to see something. Now, look at this. Now, look at this picture here. Now, what this picture is, this is a picture of the armor of the Shogun in Japan. Now, the picture of the armor of the Shogun of Japan has a picture right there of Furu Ryo. Now, let's look at the next picture. Let's look at a close-up. Now, I want you to look at this picture. Now, I don't care how much of what Reverend Rubin says about Furu Ryo, that is a picture of a black god. There he is on the Shogun of Japan. Now, how could the Shogun of Japan put the black god Fudu Myoho on his chest going into battle talking about he's depressed? That is the most stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, and this man cannot get beyond his racism. 
but yet this man is going around teaching people Buddhism and telling you that when you see this image, it means, oh, I'm not feeling good, yet the Shogun of Japan put this image on him, on his chest, as you saw. Let's take this thing further. And, and, and I hope that the priest, her name is Muke Shonen. Muke Shonen, she's buddy-buddy with this Nitrin Shu priest, who I call a racist, to even say some of the nonsense that he says. But, you know, when I wrote him back and I said he was racist, he, wrote, he said this. Now listen very carefully. He says, there are no contemporary accounts that describe any shogun as black or African. Zero. None. It is best speculation, wishful thinking, fantasy. The quote about black blood has nothing to do with race. The characters used indicated dark aura or having icy water in one's veins. I've read the articles you cited. Again, no contemporary mention of a black shogun. I have research at Risho University and I can read and write Japanese fluently. Now listen, just because you, Reverend Ruin, can read Japanese fluently, just because you white, don't make you right. Now, listen, people, listen very carefully. We live in a modern technological society in that I do not have to go to all of the Risho University in Japan where he could not find any reference to a black shogun. All you have to do is get on the computer now listen, Reverend Runen. Listen very carefully. You, sir, say that you cannot find any reference to a black shogun. Well, sir, and listen to me very carefully. Listen. All you have to do is Google the word black shogun. Just Google the word. And when you Google the word Black Shogun, a name is going to come up. And the name that comes up is this Shogun's name. Now, me, Anthony Elmore, I cannot pronounce the name. His name is Sakanoye Tamuromato. Now, I can't pronounce the word, but I have intelligence enough to tell my 15-year-old son to Google this and scroll down to Ancestry. And when you scroll down to Ancestry, sir, what you come into, you will get a name of this, Af of this Ancestry and the name that comes up is Alexander. Francis Chamberlain. Now, this white priest says he cannot find one single example of a black shogun in all of Japan, but yet when you Google the word black shogun, then the name Alexander Francis Chamberlain comes up. Now, either this priest has got to be the most dumbest guy in the world or he must be the most disingenuous guy in the world because when you look at American history listen people very carefully the first person in America to get a doctorate degree in anthropological science was Dr. Alexander Francis Chamberlain. 
Y'all didn't hear me. You did not hear Q. They didn't hear me. The first man in America, Dr. Alexander Francis Chamberlain, was the first man in America to get a degree in anthropological science. Now, Dr. Chamberlain was born in England. His family moved to Canada. This anthropological scientist studied the Indians. And he studied the Indians. He also worked for the British Academy of, the, of Advancement of Science. In other words, this man was a contributor to the encyclopedias that we used to read in America. Now, when you begin to vet this man, Dr. Francis, Dr. Alexander Francis Chamberlain, and you begin to study him, you will find out that Dr. Alexander Francis Chamberlain was one of the most fairest guys in the world. Because he was a man before his time. He was not like Reverend Rudin. Reverend Rudin is a guy that don't want to give African Americans credit. He wants to discredit you because he is a man that can speak Japanese. But if you look at Dr. Alexander Francis Chamberlain, this man wrote a child psychology book. This man was in every academic program and study that was in the world. This man was an academic scholar who wrote that sociology or anthropology or science or no one person should be able to call themselves superior. So what Dr. Alexander Francis Chamberlain did, he wrote a journal, being an anthropologist. He just did not stick to America, but he dealt with the world and the evolution of man. And what Dr. Alexander Francis Chamberlain did, he wrote a paper in 1911, over a hundred years ago, that said that we go to Japan and we find the first shogun of Japan and he was a Negro. Now, this is a man who is the first anthropolo anthropological scientist in the United States of America and Reverend Root is going to try to discredit this man? This man who has studied the history, the anthropology, he's a man who's trying to be fair in America, but yet this racist priest going to lift his racist head up and he's going to try to discredit me in front of my son? How dare you? And even after he wrote this, he says he cannot find, what, what did Reverend Rudin say? He says this. He says, there are no contemporary accounts of any black shogun. He apparently have not read the book that was written in 1989 by Mark Hammond called The Black Shogun of Japan. He has not read black history because if you read black history, you will find that the first people who come to Japan, in fact, the first people who came to Asia, period, were African people. But this man does not want to know the truth. But I, there's a priest. Her name is Muke Shonen. Now, Muke Shonen, her mother, she's an African-American priest. She's a woman. She's in Houston, Texas. Muke Shonen, do you agree with such nonsense? Now, See, Muke Shonen should know about the name W.E.B. Du Bois. 
He was born in 1868, died in 1963. He wrote a book called The Negro, first published in 1915. He played Sacanario Takamorario with the son of the most distinguished black rulers. The father of black history. Now, when you go to the father of black history and you go to the man that started Black History Month, he too talks about the black shogun of Japan. Do you think that Mukai Shonen or the other blacks in Nichiren Shu would say something to this priest? Of course they would not say nothing to Reverend Rumen. You cannot even talk intelligently to them. Because they wouldn't do it, they would not care. Now, if we go down the list of all the people, now, we understood that Carter G. Whitson, the father of Negro history, wrote about this. Charles Harris Wesley wrote about it. Now, in the 1940 Negro History Bulletin, Dr. Woodson and the artist Louis Mello Jones contributed an article about the Black Shogun of Japan. I mean, when we go down, very similar in 1946 in the Orient, Distinguished Negroes Abroad, a book by Beatrice J. Fleming and Miriam J. Pride, is which contained a small chapter dedicated to the Negro General, Sakanayo Takamoraro. Chaka, who is a member in Memphis, Chaka has the whole book on J.A. Rogers called Sex and Race. J.A. Rogers contributed a whole lot on this subject for over a hundred years. This has been in the African American community about this general in Japan. But it's also known in black history that the first inhabitants of the first dynasty in China, they were African people because the first people on the face of the earth were African people. Now, what happens in history, ladies and gentlemen, is a priest like Reverend Runan can get away with things like that. He can distort history because he is white. And so to him and others like him, white is right. In fact, it reminds me of the story about John, who is the good colored man. Did, did y'all hear the story about John, the good colored man? Let me tell you about John, the good colored man. Back in the day, when the blacks used to wait on the white folk, John was the best servant in the world to Miss Ann. Now, Miss Ann Johnson was a good old Southern Belle woman, and John used to wait on Miss John's Miss Johnson hand and feet. And Miss Johnson, she's a good old white lady. She break this brother seven, six and a half days and give him a half day on Sunday off to go to church. So. John, the good colored guy, would go to church on Sunday. So one, one Sunday, she called him on his half a day off when, because she needed a little service and he, she wanted him to wait on her. And so old, the old colored man John came and rushed to Miss Johnson's time, Miss Ann Johnson. So when he got to Miss Ann Johnson's house, old brother John had a brand new suit of clothes. And all of a sudden, that old John used to wear all these old dirty clothes. And Miss Ann Johnson looked at him shocked. And she said, that nigga done stole some money from me because I ain't paid that nigga no money to get no clothes. So Miss Ann Johnson called the police. And and they locked Brother John up, the good colored man, hadn't done a thing, but wore a good suit of clothes to church. Now, 
They kept John in jail for a couple of days and said, we're going to make him suffer. And find out the two or three days and old John interrogating John and beating up on John. And the, the John got in front of the judge and John said, the judge said, all right, brother John, did you take money from Miss Johnson? He said, no, sir. He said, he said, well, Bro John, where you get the money to buy a new suit at? He said, son, I've been working with Miss Johnson for 30 years. I've been saving my nickels and dimes, and I've been trying all of my life to get me a new set of clothes. And I hadn't taken no money, and your honor, I swear, between God, I pray to God and fine work, man, that I ain't took no money, saw. And the judge looked at Brother John, and the judge said, what, John? He said, sir, I pray, and I swear between God and fine work, man, that I ain't took no money. And when John told that judge that he had prayed in front of fine work, man, he said, what, John, you prayed and you swear before five white men? He said, yes, sir. George hit the gavel. What? Case dismissed. <laughs> now, why was the case dismissed? The case was dismissed because the good old Carter boy John swore between, swore to five white men. Now, the moral of the story is, back in that day, they didn't care about God. They want to make sure the Negro respect and bow down to a white man. So the moral of this story is this. A white priest, Reverend, what's the name? Runen Sorison, a Nitsen Shoe priest, Anthony Elmore, is not about to bow down to this man. I am going to teach a Buddhism that deals with history. And I am going to encourage people to be scientific, to be able to study, to learn. Do not be some common person. And what was that tale they said? Uh, Roosevelt said this. He says, I choose not to be a common man. It is my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity. I refuse to be a kept citizen and humble and dull by the state looking after me. I prefer the challenges of life to the guarantee of existence. I prefer the thrill of fulfillment to the guaranteed existence. I will count before the master. I will bend to the threat. It is my heritage to stand erect, proud, and unafraid to say, this is what I've done. So, Anthony L. Elmore, as a Buddhist, we want to stand proud, erect, and unafraid to be able to tell the truth. So, when you begin to study Buddhism, and you look at all these racist images in Buddhism, and you begin to delineate the Hindu Buddhism, from the other Buddhisms because it's all mixed up. And when you begin to get a sense of history and a sense of study, then you can understand. But you are not going to learn Buddhism correctly from a Reverend Runan because he does not want you to stand proud. Anytime a man was stand there, and when I'm sitting there with my son, to try to just to give him a little encouragement, he is an example of those like him and others who want to bring you down. Just like in Memphis, Tennessee, I started to practice Nichiren Shu Buddhism. And Muke Shonen cut me off. Why? Because they don't want you to tell a story they're not interested in you teaching people a sense of history, a sense of dignity. They would rather tell you, don't come back to the Nichiren Shu 
millions anymore. So I'm going to cut it off right here. Let you see for yourself that there is a history that we've never even seen. And there's a great Buddhism here in Nietzsche's Buddhism, but the way these people teach it, you're not going to get it. Have a good day. Thank you very much.